Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you're located. We are going to wait um, one more minute uh, just to wait for the rest of the participants to join, and then we will we'll start. Thank you for being here. people are joining so we shall wait one more minute and then we'll start so we are on time Okay, we shall start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're located, esteemed panelists and participants. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Sofia Delger, consultant for the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Network, BestNet, Indigenous and Local Knowledge Support Unit led by the UNESCO Program on Local and Indigenous, Indigenous Knowledge Systems, UNESCO Links. I'm the chairperson and moderator for today's session. Um, on behalf of the co-organizers of the webinar, BestNet, SweetBio at the Stockholm Resilience Center and the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, I extend a warm welcome to all of you to this open webinar on the human rights-based approach in co-creation of knowledge for biodiversity and ecosystem services action. It is a pleasure to have you join us today on this Build to Our platform um, as we delve into this crucial topic. Before we begin, um, next slide, please. Uh, before we begin, I have a few uh, housekeeping notes to ensure that our webinar runs smoothly. Firstly, please note that your microphones are muted throughout the session to minimize background noise. Uh, we'll unmute you if you wish to contribute. Secondly, we encourage active participation, so please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions or share your thoughts. We will also use Mentimeter in one section of the webinar. You will be provided with details in the chat. Please note that this session is recorded and will be distributed after the webinar. Lastly, we kindly request that you keep your questions concise and relevant to the topic to allow for as many participants as possible to contribute. I would like to also inform um, that uh, we have simultaneous interpretation services, uh, both in Spanish and English. To access the interpretation, please click on the interpretation button, the globe at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select your preferred language. We aim to make this webinar accessible to as many participants as possible. So please make us uh, make use of this feature if needed. To briefly summarize the agenda for today's session, we will start with opening remarks from Nigel Krohal, who is Chief of Section of UNESCO Local and Indigenous Knowledge Systems Program, UNESCO Links. Then Lucy Mulenke, who is Chair of the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, Executive Director of the Indigenous Information Network, and Co-Founder and Co-Chair of the Indigenous Women Biodiversity Network, will set the scene and provide further remarks. Thereafter, we will have a dialogue presentation on human rights-based approach and its significance in working with indigenous peoples and local communities between Pernilla Malmer, senior advisor at SweetBio, and Ashanapuri Hertz, program officer at SweetBio. Next, we will hear a presentation from Opie Outhwaite, environmental law specialist at the UN Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center, UNEP WCMC, that will provide insights on the legal perspectives on the right to a healthy environment and its implication for indigenous peoples and local communities. We will then have a fireside chat on human rights-based approach and its role in enabling indigenous peoples and local communities in the co-creation of knowledge with two case studies, one from Kenya 
by Peri Skariuki, member of the Kenya National Trialogue and senior researcher at the National Museums of Kenya, and another for Bosnia and Herzegovina by Ena Hatibovic from the Center for Research and Development at the University of Sarajevo and project officer of the Bosnia and Herzegovina National Ecosystem Assessment Team. The fireside chat will be moderated by my esteemed colleague, Alexandra Postrigan, Partnership Building and Stakeholder Engagement Officer from BestNet UNDP. Then I will be chairing a questions and answers session. And finally, we'll hear some closing remarks from Yuko Kurauchi, who is BestNet Coordinator and Program Specialist at BestNet UNDP. Thank you everyone for being with us today. I would, uh, would now like to in invite Nigel Krohal, Chief of Section uh, of the Local and Indigenous Knowledge System Programs at UNESCO to deliver the opening remarks. Nigel, the floor is yours. Sophia, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, there's been uh, exceptional interest in this webinar and I think it speaks to the times we live in and uh, we welcome you all and uh, thank you for the engagement and, and enthusiasm about this. Uh, for a long time, indigenous peoples and local communities have expressed their uh, desire and will to be involved in the production of knowledge, to engage in national and international decision-making around the environment. And and uh, after a long period where that was difficult to achieve, it's now suddenly flourishing in different parts of the world. Uh, and there's some really great examples and some of them we're gonna to touch on here. Um, this uh, event has been put together uh, as a coalition of a team that's working particularly on ecosystems and biodiversity assessments. And uh, it's co-sponsored by the BestNet initiative, the Biodiversity and Ecosystems Network, uh, which has uh, three founding agencies working in it, uh, UNDP, uh, the, uh, sorry, the UN Development Program, uh, uh, the UNEP uh, World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge uh, and UNESCO, uh, as well as the partnership with the International Indigenous Peoples uh, Forum on Biodiversity. Uh, and uh, Lucy will be joining us uh, from the IIFB team, as well as SWEDBIO, that has been an important partner and uh, supporter in this process. SWEDBIO's role also includes uh, being one of the donors in helping these uh, human rights-based approaches to uh, assessment and knowledge production along with the government of Germany. So we thank the donors who have been supporting these processes as well. A few opening remarks is uh, we live in exciting times with new technologies uh, where it is possible for many different people to share their knowledge, to uh, produce knowledge together, to try to take care of our planet through a, a broad spectrum of different uh, practices of custodianship, of relationships, of values about nature. Uh, but within that, there's also rights-based issues. Uh, one is the historic issues uh, around uh, the um, uh, in some cases, the loss of rights of communities or we're in the process of regaining that, uh, as well as issues about intellectual property rights uh, when dealing with knowledge production, and especially in the new areas of uh, new technologies and uh, new types of knowledge productions. For many of the communities that are involved in these processes, which may include you who are involved in the webinar, uh, it also involves collective knowledge, knowledge that has been built up over generations, sometimes many generations, about weather and climate, around ecosystems, around practices and ways of knowing. And how is that collectivity recognized in, um, in, in uh, property rights and other human rights uh, related initiatives uh, in the West Western tradition, uh, particularly the Euro European tradition, the focus was on the rights of the individual, the rights of the individual in relation to the state, the rights of the individual in relation to others. Whereas much of the planet, or probably most of the planet, uh, has conceptualizations that are more complex, that involves the society, uh, relationships and responsibilities. Uh, in the African regional uh, mechanism, for example, uh, uh, we talk about the African uh, Charter on Human and people's rights. So the idea is that the person, the individual, is located in a larger uh, context. And when we look at rights-based approaches, it then uh, 
poses to us questions about the collectivities uh, that are holders and reproducers of knowledge and the beneficiaries. And then the relationship between sometimes private uh, institutions or government institutions in relation to these different uh, customary uh, procedures. So we're looking at a complex constellation of rights and some of that may be quite challenging, but it also provides opportunities uh, as well. So in this webinar, we're going to try to explore that in the production of multiple streams of knowledge, different types of evidence, different ways of knowing the world and valuing it. How do we draw that together in a rights-based approach that is in, um, able to provide benefits, but also protect people and respect uh, different cultures around the world and different norms in terms of how people wish to share their knowledge and and how that uh, relationship goes so sophia i'll stop there and i uh, believe we're going to move on to some very interesting presentations now so over to you thank you nigel for your insightful remarks um we were going to have lucy mulenke now i don't know if lucy is connected um Lucy um, is a co-chair of the International and Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity and Executive Director of the Indigenous Information Network. Um, we, were, we were going to have Lucy for um, some further remarks, but uh, she had an emergency. So if Lucy is not here, maybe uh, she can join later and, and provide us with, with some um, perspective on human rights-based approach in biodiversity and ecosystem services um, co-creation of knowledge. Um, in that case, if Lucy is not here, we are gonna go to the next session. Uh, that is a dialogue presentation on the significance of the human rights-based approach in working with indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, this session will be moderated by Pernilla Malmer and Ashanapuri Hertz from SweetBio. Uh, in this session, we will be using Mentimeter uh, so first, we would like to invite you to join Mentimeter for this first uh, uh, question. Uh, you can go to menti.com and use the code, um, or you can scan the code bar with your phone. Um, and then um, after this question, Pernila and uh, Puri will take it from here. Just to repeat again, to, to answer the question, you can go to menti.com and enter the code um, or use the, the barcode. Thank you. We're getting some answers. Great to see that people are are in the menti replying and then I will pass it to, to Puri and Pernilla. This is great, we're getting a lot of answers. Thank you for participating. Hey, I, I, this is Pernilla, happy to be with you. I think we are getting quite exciting answers here and we can see that at the heart of everything is justice, equity, respect, but also with a lot of supporting functions about indigenous knowledge, ecosystem services, rights holders, democracy, 
I think what, what we see here is really the diversity of how we recognize people in the world and create exactly the base for a human rights-based approach in biodiversity. And Puri, uh, maybe we can start then now with uh, reflecting about the human rights-based approach in biodiversity with this very good word client, maybe develop it a bit more and then we, we yeah, go on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thanks for your um, mentee response. Indeed, this is very interesting. So applying a human rights-based approach in the implementation of the new post-2020 um, agenda have an enormous a potential to facilitate transformative changes and halt biodiversity loss. Um, that means that biodiversity policies, governance and management do not violate um, high human rights. Those implementing the policies should actively seek uh, to promote human rights in the design and implementation. Mm -hmm. But maybe Pernilla, you can also tell us all how does a human rights-based approach mm -hmm. help biodiversity? Yes, exactly. The idea with the human rights-based approach is that rights holders like indigenous peoples and local communities in the context of the CBD, by exercising their rights, will be able to realize their potential to protect and use nature sustainably. IPES Global Assessment recognized that land governance by indigenous peoples and local communities have higher conservation values and that biodiversity are declining less rapidly there. Mm -hmm. Among the reasons are that uh, traditional knowledge about nature and their values and cultures allow them to preserve the territories where they live more efficient. For that reason, the Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework acknowledged the important contribution of indigenous peoples and local communities as custodians of biodiversity and as partners in conservation, restoration, and sustainable use. Mm -hmm. For upholding this potential, indigenous peoples and local community need to have rights to their lands and territories. They also must have the right to meaningful and effective participation in decision making. This is what human rights-based approach means in the biodiversity context. Okay, so I see. So you mean that if indigenous peoples and local communities are respected and get the opportunity to feel safe about continuing mm -hmm. their customary sustainable use of their lands, it will be better protected. Mm -hmm. And if we recognize and respect their knowledge, learn from them and take on board their proposals in our policy process as equally valid to science, um, the policy will, much, uh, will work mm -hmm. much better then. Yes. Yes, exactly. And there are actually evidence from science that if you use the knowledge of holders of indigenous and local knowledge mm -hmm. in the design of policies and engage with them in the process, the policy will be much faster and better implemented. So Puri, how would this sound in human rights language? Um, okay, I'll try to explain it this way. Um, the there are duty bearers and rights holders and the different responsibilities and obligations of each um, in the context of biodiversity, but also as in, in everything else, basically. So within the category of duty bearers, states hold specific duties under international law. However, non-state actors like businesses, they also hold obligations and duties. The duties of state as well as non-state actors to respect human rights is an integral part of a human rights-based approach. Mm -hmm. However, it is worth noting uh, that all duty bearers are also rights holders in their role as human being. Um, so we'll start with the state as duty bearers to promote respect protect and fulfill human rights with regards to biodiversity. That means that they should secure access to information um, in, and then secure participations of rights holders in the processes and access to justice, including the protection of environmental and human rights defenders. For companies as duty bearers, it means, for example, they should apply due diligence with, when their activities concern biodiversity. Due diligence is a process in which they identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for the negative impacts of their activities. 
And now on the rights holder side. Um, so these are all individuals or social groups that have particular entitlement in relation to specific duty bearers. Mm -hmm. All human beings, again, are rights holders under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Critical rights holders in the context of biodiversity are indigenous peoples and local community. Um, particularly important for biodiversity is to recognize both individual and collective rights. And the latter, for example, collectively held customary rights to traditional lands, mm -hmm. territories, and resources, and also traditional knowledge. Yeah. Exactly. And this is what also uh, Nigel was very clear about in, in her person in his presentation. Yes. And now we have actually the second Mentimeter question. So now I uh, leave back to the Bessler team. So so this is very interesting. Uh, because it also is a bit about what are your engagement now in the biodiversity and um, processes, both in the ecosystem assessment processes, of course, but also if you are one of those working in uh, applying or trying to now start the implementation of the Kunming uh, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework designing the new national biodiversity strategy and action plans, or maybe starting to think through how you in your management plan for a protected area or like finding ways of designing new processes that align then more with, well, the, the, um, uh, the, the context which have been agreed now in the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework to work with a human rights-based approach. Um, so this is quite interesting. And uh, most of you as so far identify as both rights over and duty bearer. And in most cases that is correct many time if you are, for example, leading um, national biodiversity strategy and action uh, plan, you have a very strong role, of course, as a mm -hmm. duty bearer uh, related to the rights holders. So mm -hmm. in, in that case, or if you are having a company, your responsibility as the duty bearer in that role are likely the most. Yeah. And indigenous peoples as uh, rights holders are also very critical that they can be aware of this and engage in the process and that the duty bearer have provided space for them. Okay, so now we are a bit back now to, to uh, how we think this look in, look in practice for a duty bearer. Mm -hmm. Is to say a government who now aims to update its national biodiversity strategy and action plan to implement the global biodiversity framework. How could, how would it start them to, to uh, have this uh, approach? Yeah, so um, it is important that there is a support mm. from duty bearers and a mm. mechanism in place for ensuring participations of all rights holders, particularly mm. keeping attention for creating necessary mm. conditions for participation of those who are most dependent on biodiversity for their livelihoods mm. and many times marginalized and having less opportunities mm. to bring their proposals and demands to the table and often not even aware of their mm. rights. Yeah. yeah, that is actually the situation in many cases. And one good example here is when you apply are applying a landscape approach, for example, which is very common when you work with implementing NBSAPs. Mm -hmm. Multi-actor dialogues are very important tools. And in, in designing these dialogues, there is a need to actively think through who are the rights holders and ensure they are represented by themselves. Mm -hmm. It's the say with regards of indigenous peoples and local communities, relate to their own communities and networks and organizations, 
and not take for granted that they, for example, a conversation a conservation organization which they are working with would be the representative. Also, in the dialogue, think about methods that bring space for them to really articulate their knowledge and experiences and introduce and argue for their own proposals. This is about empowering rights holders in a human rights based approach. Okay. But speaking of empowering, I would like to bring another dimension of a human rights based mm -hmm. approach, which is to secure the inclusion. Um, of the equal participation of women and youth in the mm. process, we need to ensure that all efforts of biodiversity conservation um, respond to the interest of women and youth, providing them with the opportunity mm. to improve their social and economic um, and survival. It mm. is important to fully recognize their knowledge, contribution, mm. and leadership mm. to biodiversity conservation, mm. to ensure gender responsive actions, but mm. also intergenerational equity. Um, and you brought uh, the Kunming Montreal Global mm. Biodiversity Framework beforehand when we did the Menti. So, these are um, aligned with the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and its consideration for the implementation that serve as a critical yes. guidance mm -hmm. um, for its successful um, implementation. And that means uh, participation, access to information, recognition of their equal rights and access to land and natural mm -hmm. resources must be ensured. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now we have been talking about human rights-based approach in biodiversity and ecosystem service action more generally. But to be more spe specific, how can human rights-based approach be applied in co-creation of knowledge about biodiversity? Mm -hmm. Well, all collaboration across knowledge system needs to be based on equity and respect. This is important to highlight as power structures in our society generally sets Western science above any other knowledge systems. We have to dismantle this structure and replace it with measurement for equity. Free prior and informed consent is an example of safeguard in this context, but actually it starts with how you design the process of sharing of knowledge from the onset of problem formulation and ensure it's useful for all actors involved. Okay, well, that reminds um, me of how we actually at Sweat Bio apply this in our work and that the application of a human rights-based approach in our work reminds us to observe and understand power structures, supports the rights holders, as well as empower them to exert their rights um, related mm. to their knowledge. Um, furthermore, it also serves mm. to hold the duty bearers accountable yes. towards the rights holders and how knowledge is traveling when it's used after um, we share it. And this is why we apply the multi evidence based approach in the sweat bios multi actor dialogues and other interactions engaging rights holders and duty bearers and you also mentioned multi actor dialogues beforehand, could you elaborate these two connections, please. Mm. Yes, and expressed in human rights based approach language the multiple evidence based method serves to elevate and highlight rights holders knowledge. And now uh, you can switch to the PowerPoint with the map. Um, uh, and here you see that, well, um, strengthen the capacity and confidence to articulate, articulate and argue for it and introduce their own proposal. When traditional knowledge is mobilized and shared, it contributes to make the holders of traditional knowledge as well as the knowledge itself respected. And that way to reduce the structural power imbalances between rights holders and duty bearers we talked on earlier. So here we have a model of the um, multiple evidence-based approach. And it, it emphasizes that it's important to promote and enable equal and transparent connection between knowledge systems and to empower communities in order to fulfill the potential of knowledge synergy for equitable ecosystem governance. So in the map, we bring together a diversity of knowledge holder on an actual platform where power imbalances are recognized and diverse perspectives are valued. 
So the different colored strand you see here in the middle represent different knowledge systems, such as indigenous or local knowledge from different territories or communities, scientific knowledge from different disciplines or traditions, and practitioners' knowledge. And each of these strands are equally valid and represent complementary perspectives contributing to an enriched picture of a particular issue illustrated in the center of the image. Mm -hmm. So you have like an integrity in each of these knowledge streams mm -hmm. and it's uh, science are equally valid to all the other knowledge streams. Mm -hmm. uh, but then to make this work like in this circle you see uh, here on the process, uh, you have really to have a careful attention to the process and how the actors and institution of re respective knowledge systems are included and involved. And this is critical to ensure that each knowledge contribution is fair, legitimate and mobilized in a way that strengthens the knowledge holders and the knowledge system as such. The outcome would feed back into practice and the decision making among actors. And in this we have identified five tasks which are critical for successful outcome based on equity. And you see them here in the circle, it's mobilize, translate, negotiate, synthesize and apply. To mobilize means to articulate knowledge, to make it visible and possible to share with others. It is about empowering knowledge holders as rights holders, they have right to their knowledge. Mobilization give confidence to explain and argue for your knowledge lived experience and concern, which is needed to effectively take part in policymaking processes and co-creation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. The translation means interaction among knowledge holders from different knowledge systems to enable common understanding of the shared knowledge. Active participation on equal terms is needed to secure rights, equity and respect in sharing, to build trust and enable mutual learning. This is critical for meaningful taking part also in policy processes and to understand one another's perspective. Uh, and then negotiate in this context is about discuss and jointly analyze the knowledge contribution and open and respectful way in, for example, a policy discussion or a creation of understanding of an ecosystem. There will be a common understanding, but also disagreements and contradictions. Mm -hmm. And here we have to ensure a safe space to, so that agreements as well as potential differences between actors are acknowledged and respected. And then next step here is to synthesize. And that is about shaping broadly accepted common knowledge bases for a diversity of knowledge system. The inclusive, transparent, and respectful process at earlier stages that have recognized divergent perspectives on this agreement will pay off here. Rights holders have free prior and informed consent on their knowledge all through the process. Mm -hmm. And when we have this final uh, way of discuss, it cre creates the joint and rich picture, which contains also some strands that are not agreed to. And that is not the problem because it can be next step to analyze and understand. And finally, apply means to use the common knowledge basis we have brought together to make decisions and take actions or make further co-creation of knowledge. Plurality is essential to secure usefulness for all actors involved and that the MEB process is reinforcing and feeding back learning to rights holders from all involved knowledge system and that duty bearers can take advantage of this in a decision making context for the benefit of all. Okay, so to my understanding in that case, MEB approach was created for a meeting and co-creation of knowledge mm -hmm. across knowledge systems. But the model seems to be able to be applied in many different contexts such as policy, um, processes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so but this brings me to a human rights based approach and its principles, the planet principles. Um, if we could go to yes, thank you very much. Um, and the, there are six principles, 
participations linked to human rights obligation, accountability, non-discrimination, empowerment, and transparency. And my understanding is that MEB approach allows inclusion of all actors mm -hmm. uh, without discrimination, ensuring active, free, and meaningful participation in contributing to policy and decision-making processes. And by allowing such spaces, states and other duty bearers are accountable for the observance of human rights, providing it is done in compliance with the standards enshrined in the international human rights instrument. And last but not least, um, what I would like to highlight here is that human rights are indivisible, whether of a civil, cultural, economic, social, or political nature, they are all inherent to the dignity of every human person. They all have equal status as rights and cannot be ranked. But we also need to understand and underline the interdependence and interrelatedness of human rights. The realization of one right often depend in, a whole, in whole or in part uh, upon the realization of others. For instance, realization of the right to health may depend on the realization of the right to information, mm -hmm. which we have brought up earlier. Yes, thank you, Puri. So now here we are back where we started. Um, and we would like to have a new Mentimeter here that is about how you visualize when you hear human rights-based approach and biodiversity conservation together now after we have been thinking through this. So let's see if we get some uh, results. Here now we are still waiting, but we have some st starting inclusion. No. These are two, yeah. I think all these are very positive contribution. And I think if we use uh, equal participation, inclusion, collaboration, and co-creation of knowledge, we will really manage to save biodiversity together and bend the curve of biodiversity loss yeah. because the main concept we really want to share with you is that human rights and biodiversity conservation is really reinforcing they are have so many co-benefits for people and planets and our future and the values and cultures of indigenous peoples and local communities are something that we can really can up as, as a positive sign to bending the curve. And I think this is a wonderful word cloud actually with collaboration and equity and inclusion and participation in the center of monitoring, cosmovision, Wow, this is wonderful. I found some, uh, I found an answer that yeah. a lot of work need to be done. It's also not wrong. Yes, <laughs> that, is, uh, that is small, but it's, it's uh, yeah, so that's why I don't find it. I, but it is uh, quite important. It is. <laughs> a lot of work to be done. And, and, but here we are inspiring one another. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much all for your participation. Mm -hmm. And I'll, yeah, we'll refer, uh, yeah, we'll pass it back to the BestNet team. Thank you. Thank you, Pernilla and Bori, for sharing your valuable insights. And thank you, everyone, for engaging and participation, uh, participating on the Mentimeter. I want to remind, remind everyone to please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions or share your thoughts. Uh, during the Q&A, you will be able to, to directly ask questions also to our panelists. And I know there are some hands that already have been raised. Um, we will give you the time during the Q&A to ask the questions or share your thoughts. Now I invite um, Opie Outhwaite, an environmental law specialist at UNEP WCMC, 
to provide us with a presentation on the legal aspects and frameworks supporting a human rights-based approach. Opi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sophia. Um, Oh, sorry, skip on to the next one straight away. So you already heard that I'm a PR3, um, I'm an environmental law specialist at UNEP WCMC. Um, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes on the implications of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And you'll see that this links really strongly with what we just heard from our SWED bio colleagues. Um, and, and hopefully will help to add a little bit more of the kind of human rights legal dimension um, to that discussion that we've just been having. Okay, so if I can go into the next slide. So as you might or might not be aware, um, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution just about a year ago, recognizing the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a universal human right. So, um, a resolution of the UN General Assembly is not legally binding, so that means that it's not, it doesn't introduce an obligation on states as duty bearers, as we heard, to give effect to the right. Um, it's not the same as signing a treaty, for example, but it is very politically persuasive, um, as a, you can infer from the um, endorsement from the UN General Assembly. It will place pressure on those to whom it's addressed, which includes states, but also non-state actors, uh, to make sure that their laws, policies, regulations, procedures, and other measures are consistent with this right. Um, and a couple of important things before I, I go into a little bit more detail about the content of the right. Um, the resolution recognises the importance for the realisation of the right to a healthy environment of the full implementation of existing multilateral environmental agreements, MEAs. So um, those commitments relating to, for example, Indigenous peoples, uh, traditional knowledge that have already been made uh, in MEAs are recognised, um, endorsed and indeed the expectation is that the implementation of those commitments should be accelerated by the recognition of the right to a healthy environment. Something else that I think is just worth uh, making a note of, and I'm going to quote directly from the text of the resolution here, is that it recognises that while the human rights implications of environmental damage are felt by individuals and communities around the world, the consequences are felt most acutely by women and girls and those segments of the population that are already in vulnerable situations, including indigenous peoples, children, older persons and persons with disabilities. So um, the, the particular vulnerability of certain groups in relation to um, the human rights implications of environmental damage. And a final point to note about uh, this resolution is that um, although many countries, indeed over 100 countries, already recognise a right to a health environment in some iteration or another, the um, recognition at this international level should and is intended to lead to a more harmonised approach in understanding uh, what the right entails and more consistency in the way that it's protected um, and applied. Okay, so I can have my next, my next one. Um, so I'm going to just reflect for a minute on the significance of a human rights footing um, for this right. So recognition of the right to healthy environment is potentially very significant in facilitating a human rights based approach. It sets an expectation. Um, as I said, on states as well as non-state actors. And it's expected to galvanize action to promote the realization of the right and its components. And you can see the components here and I'll, I'll look at them in more detail in a moment. Um, and this is, uh, that expectation arises from the way that we have seen action follow other 
um, human rights, the recognition of, for example, the right to um, water. So, um, as we already heard, human rights are understood to be universal, indivisible, inter interdependent and interrelated. And that means human rights apply to everyone. There are general principles of non-discrimination in human rights. And it also importantly means that it's not possible to pick and choose which rights or which components of rights should be protected. The understanding is that they are um, they go together. So recognition of the right to a healthy environment as a human right is expected to lead to better recognition and protection of the right and its components at national levels, um, and in turn help the implementation of multilateral environmental agreements. And in doing that is expected to help to address some of the gaps in coverage and implementation and protection that exist within the, the international framework as it is. One of the benefits of relying on human rights law is that human rights law, um, including at, at national levels and also regional levels, is often uh, provides more established mechanisms for the enforcement of rights. So for individuals to enforce their rights, rights holders to enforce their rights as against duty bearers, to hold those duty bearers who have an obligation to respect and protect human rights to account. Um, and in many cases, compared with environmental law, for example, um, human rights law is more established in national law and provides better opportunities for access to justice. So, what you can see on this diagram, hopefully you, you can see it, um, the text is a little bit small, is that um, the, the right to a healthy environment is understood to involve several components. And these are grouped generally as substantive rights and procedural rights. So under substantive rights, we can see rights to a non-toxic environment, clean air, a safe climate, healthy ecosystems on biodiversity, safe and sufficient water, and healthy and sustainable food. Those are rights that exist in and of themselves. On the other side of this uh, circle, we can see the procedural rights. Procedural rights are those rights that need to be in place in order that substantive rights can be enjoyed. So here we can see the right to seek, receive, and impart information, the right to participate in environmental decision making, and the right to effective justice and remedy. Um, so we can see as for the purposes of our discussion today that the role of Indigenous knowledge can be necessary at multiple points in relation to this right. The types of knowledge and ways of knowing that we're discussing can be crucial to the realization of substantive rights. You know, thinking, for instance, about the right to biodiversity or water or food, those, those kinds of knowledge um, can be essential, as we've just heard, to understanding um, how we better realize those rights. But meaningful participation is itself also a requirement um, of the right to a healthy environment through the procedural components that we see, um, participation in environmental decision making, the right to impart information. It's not a passive right in which rights holders only receive information, but also there is a right to impart information. <clears throat> so in this sense, the right to a healthy environment provides a platform for the inclusion of indigenous members of um, indigenous people communities and local communities and their knowledge. And, and the right to effective justice and access to remedy as well is especially important for protecting environmental human rights defenders who we know frequently are indigenous peoples. Okay, if I can have my next slide. Excellent. So just a last kind of reflection on some of the, the more specific ways that 
um, we might see this right being uh, implemented, given effect to. So the resolution calls upon states, international organizations, business enterprises, and other relevant stakeholders to scale up efforts to ensure a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment for all. So if we think firstly about the kinds of actions that states might need to take, this might include things like explicitly recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment within their national laws or within their constitution. As I said, that does exist in, in many countries. We would expect to see it uh, develop further. It might include the adoption of new substantive environmental protection laws and policies relating to biodiversity and healthy ecosystems, pollution and toxins, sustainable consumption, carbon emissions, strengthening liability for environmental harm, and um, also thinking about land use rights um, and, and protection and recognition of traditional land territories and use of natural resources. It might include implementing procedural measures like improving access to environmental information, strengthening opportunities for public participation, including the ways in which different types of knowledge and ways of knowing are incorporated into decision making and improving access to justice. For example, thinking about accountability mechanisms for holding duty bearers to account. Um, and national policies, and that's all policies, economic, social and environmental, should reflect respect for this right, as is the case for other human rights. Um, so the right to a healthy environment sets an expectation, as I said, of meaningful participation. Um, and that's relevant when we think of some of the familiar actions and strategies um, that we might be used to dealing with or aware of, like updating MBSEPs, undertaking national ecosystem assessment, um, that these are entry points potentially for Indigenous knowledge. Um, and just lastly, we heard already about the human rights responsibilities of non-state actors. So the right to a healthy environment extends here also. Um, this might be things like, for example, ensuring meaningful participation in local or in-country activities for businesses, um, international business operations, for example, or where those types of entities are discharging their due diligence obligations, as we see increasingly um, a requirement on businesses. And for citizens and environmental and human rights campaigners um, and environmental defenders, recognition of the right to healthy environment at this level, recognition by the UN General Assembly, provides an influential tool that can be invoked when demanding action or accountability from governments. So although it's not legally binding, um, it is influential. Um, and when we look at, uh, for example, groups who are bringing biodiversity and climate litigation, they will be looking to invoke this right, respect for this right um, in those types of actions. Um, and I think that takes me to my final slide. Just my contact information, should you wish to follow up. Um, but hopefully you see that begins a conversation about how it can be useful to um, think about the ways in which a right to a healthy environment can promote meaningful participation and inclusion of indigenous knowledge and supports um, and facilitates the, a human rights based approach to biodiversity. Um, and then I will hand back to our BESNET colleagues. Thank you, Opie, for that informative presentation. Um, we have great questions coming up, so I invite the speakers to address the questions in writing, and then we will also try to address as much questions as we can in the Q&A session. Uh, now, I would like to transition into our fireside chat session. 
uh, which will explore the role of a human rights-based approach in enabling indigenous peoples and local communities in the co-creation of knowledge. Our moderator for this session is Alexandra Postrigan, Partnership Building and Stakeholder Engagement Officer at BestNet UNDP. Alexandra, please take it from please take it away. Thank you very much, Sofia, and thank you very much to you all. Thank you for all the participation and um, exciting questions that you shared so far. I would like to welcome um, Anna Hatibovic, who is the project lead of the National Ecosystem Assessment Team from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much, Anna, for being here. Uh, we were expecting to be joined by one other um, by one other colleague, Paris Kariuki, but I understand she is not with us. So, Anna, it will be just a fireside conversation between me and you. Um, and I'm really honored to be uh, in the dialogue with you. Um, it is such a fantastic work, and also the questions that. Uh, we've been receiving a uh, point into how the concepts and how that scene that the speakers at the beginning of this webinar set, how this can be translated into reality and how this is applied on, uh, on the ground on the country level. So this one, that's why I think it is fundamental to hear from you. And first of all, for uh, our general audience, those who were never uh, with, introduced to BestNet before or to the National Ecosystem Assessments, could you please tell us a little bit what, uh, what is your work in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the National Ecosystem Assessment and what is your role? Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. I have, I, I'm really honored. Uh, on behalf of, of, of my country to present the work that we have done um, in the in the last uh, three years. Um, I am Anna. I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which is located in on, on the Balkans in Europe. I'm the project officer of our na national ecosystem assessment. Actually, I am currently on our uh, project advisory board meeting. And we are uh, almost at the finish of our national ecosystem assessment. For those um, who are listening to this webinar who do not know so much about uh, national ecosystem assessment, is, uh, I will try to be as brief as possible. Basically, an ecosystem assessment is a collection of scientific and local knowledge about biodiversity or nature. In general, NCPs, which are nature contributions to people, which is everything that nature gives to, 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 to human beings. Uh, uh, what are the direct and indirect of biodiversity, future scenarios, and the governance, the state of the governance at national or regional or whatever level in order to give a basis for an informed decision-making about nature. Uh, so basically it's not giving uh, guidelines to the decision-makers, but giving them uh, the, 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 the right uh, science-based information by sharing the key messages uh, of, of the National Ecosystem Assessment. For Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, our uh, National Ecosystem Assessment, uh, the acronym is NEA, uh, has six chapters. Uh, it was defined uh, uh, and based uh, uh, on the ECHA report. The ECHA report is uh, European and Central Asia Assessment. We have a project team of uh, nine people. Uh, coordinating lead authors, they are 11. Uh, they are coordinating the development of the chapters of, um, of the assessment. And we have over 60 leading authors that have been developing the chapters, the texts of the, of the NEA for uh, now about, uh, well, actually three years straight. We had our first author meeting in July, 2020. Uh, of course, 
uh, there is, I have to mention that uh, NEAs are a great opportunity to in, uh, engage stakeholders, to engage knowledge holders in the co-creation of knowledge on biodiversity. Uh, also, it is really good for networking and capacity building. We have uh, so far developed four uh, scientific papers out of the, of the assessment findings for now. Uh, of course, uh, everything is great, but it is important to say that we had also challenges which hopefully will help uh, future developers of NEAs in uh, respective countries um, uh, to look for. Uh, we had uh, the complexity of the country. So every time developing a national ecosystem assessment is really important to adapt to the national circumstances. Then, then the methodology used for the development of a, of a NEAs uh, is the best methodology. Uh, the platform has a really well developed methodology, but for example, for our scientific community at the beginning, it was a, a challenge to understand and to develop um, the assessment according to, to the methodology, then it is a really good, uh, um, it is a very long uh, process which sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, overwhelming and tiring for the, for the participants. Uh, we are now finalizing the third and final order draft. We are, develop, we are focusing on the development of executive summaries and the develop, developing of SPM, Summary for Policymakers. And we are collaborating with reviewers and uh, we are starting the publication process of the uh, NEA, which hopefully will be published in, at the end of September, 2023. Thank you so much. Over to you, Alexandra. Thank you. And uh, so, so many very exciting, um, very exciting updates. Uh, okay, so let me start from a question that might, uh, might be obvious to you, but might not be obvious to the participants joining us from the countries that didn't have any national ecosystem assessment. Uh, perhaps they just learned from you what are the national ecosystem assessments. So um, it is not such a frequent choice to work with uh, right holders and with local knowledge holders, for example. So in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, why did you decide to work with the local communities as rights holders and knowledge holders? Uh, and what, was, what were the enabling forces for that? Thank you, thank you for this, for this excellent question. Actually, uh, how did we uh, figure out to engage right holders? During one of our author meetings uh, in, at the beginning of 2021, one of our uh, social scientists that was involved in the development of the NEA proposed that we should work with local communities to just to have their thoughts uh, about the development of the assessment, to present them the assessment, uh, to, to, to engage them to tell them that not only scientific knowledge is important for a development of an assessment, but also the traditional, the local knowledge is really important. It is important because also we understood that policy recommendations that will come out of the assessment will probably have direct impact on local communities. So it was critical to consult and engage them. And that's why after that author meeting, uh, we approached UNEP WCMC, which was really, we, and they were thrilled with, the, with this idea. So they financed the first part of our research. And um, then after that in 2022, the project was supported by UNESCO. Uh, so uh, after, the whole research, uh, we uh, made this publication. I will put the link on it uh, uh, later. Uh, there will be uh, 
soon is in, in the next couple of weeks it will be also in english now it's just on on um, a local language um and we after the the research after this these dialogues were made we made is made also changes in the zero order draft in order to accommodate the findings of this uh, research on the on indigenous and local knowledge so we have formulated the questions also for the traditional knowledge holders dialogue in accordance with the chapters of the NEA assessment. So uh, during our uh, participatory dialogues, we have uh, as we had a set of questions where uh, we asked them things about NCPs, direct and indirect drivers, have, have there been any changes in the state of biodiversity or nature, as they call it, um, uh, before and and now? Uh, what are they thoughts of what what the future would look like if we, for example, continue uh, caring, let's say, about nature like this, or we maybe uh, approach a, a, a different way of, of, of governance. And so after that, we have incorporated all these findings of this uh, research in our NEA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So this is an exciting case. And this is one of the reasons why we, we were so happy and so grateful for you uh, for joining this webinar and for sharing your experience. Um, but now, okay, you, you um, the assessment team uh, and uh, the authors decided to engage knowledge holders and rights holders. But um, how do you guarantee their meaningful engagement and participation? I'm referring to the um, to uh, the presentation that we heard from Pernilla and Puri before about the right to participate. Uh, how, how, how was it in your context? Uh, if you can share your experience of really bringing that concept into the reality on the ground in the case of, of the assessment uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. With you. Thank you. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> After the initial consultation with the social scientists and local communities, we acknowledge the rights and benefits of engaging knowledge holders in the co-creation of the national ecosystem assessment. As a result, we discussed with UNESCO and BestNet and launched this study that I have told you about before. Uh, because we wanted to examine the status now, what's the status now on traditional knowledge in this, because there was the, there were no um, uh, researches of traditional knowledge in this way, using this methodology that we have done uh, in, in, in this one. So this is basically the first one of this type. And during this two year research, we have engaged over 200 local and traditional knowledge holders through participatory methods, which were walking interviews, community dialogues, and written questionnaires. The findings of the traditional knowledge have been incorporated in all relevant chapters of the assessment, which contributed, contributed in understanding the indirect drivers of changes, eco-friendly traditional practices, multiple values of nature, including traditional, traditional, medicinal, nutritious plants, as well as a better understanding of a suitable and inclusive policy option in Bosnia. Uh, actually, we have a, a, a really interesting uh, case study where in, uh, actually in our country, uh, uh, all, uh, all uh, let's say, green projects are sold to the local communities, to the common public as good. But actually, uh, the green projects are making more harm than any other. For example, uh, we had a case at the south of Bosnia and Herzegovina on the border with Montenegro, where there was this uh, case of a green project that actually does not respect nor nature, 
nor the rights of local communities, what it is about. There was a plan of building a solar energy power plant. And it was, it is planned and will be probably, I mean, all the, the works already started, will be built in a place where the local communities have their cattle grazing and the cattle had the approach to a, a huge lake for water. And uh, this part is all a ecosystem of Mediterranean shrub, which was completely destroyed. So it wasn't an already destroyed place where, okay, we have nothing there, so we should build a solar power plant. No, they completely destroyed the ecosystems as well as people's lives, because some of them are depending, their lives dependent on, on this cattle. By law, they should have uh, the public consultation uh, published in a local paper and so on. But often happens that these uh, public consultations are published in a paper that almost doesn't exist, you know? And so the local communities doesn't have a saying in it. And, and that's why their rights were completely unrespected. And this was, this is actually a, a negative thing of the Green Project. Thank you. No, thank you for bringing this case. And um, I understand that this is the, the, one of the examples of when the right to participation uh, was uh, perhaps not fully uh, taking into consideration. So Anna, we were supposed to close here with you, but I allow me, since we have a little bit of time, just, just very briefly, I see here a question in the chat for you. Um, and I would like to take it live. So we start plugging so many questions uh, that, that we have here. Um, so the question is, how do you envision the utilization of assessment products um, and how can this contribute to promoting human rights and safeguarding traditional and local knowledge? Thank you for the question. And um, if, I don't know if you can uh, address it. Um, the question is about the utilization of the SPM and... Um, yes, yes and, of course. I mean, we, were, we, are we are developing <laughs> the, the, the SPM, the NEA in the publication was developed uh, with, 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 with the thought of having a product that could be used in future. And uh, it is important that uh, these uh, guides that uh, will be made uh, will support the, the development of the legislative and leg regulatory framework on the use and preservation of traditional knowledge. For example, in the chapter six of the publication, and as well as the assessment, the, the numbers coincide, we have had a focus on the legislation regarding ILK and ILK related topics uh, like medicinal plants. So in the publication, uh, in the publication, the chapter six, for example, is entitled Regulatory Framework for the Preservation of Traditional Knowledge. And within this uh, uh, chapter, there is a subchapter chapter entitled a regulatory framework for the preservation of traditional knowledge and the state of the regulatory framework for the protection of traditional knowledge and practices. So we have made an overview of the state and will have some key messages related of maybe what should be changed in relation of, of, of ILK and with examples from other, maybe best practices for other countries, how could we do things better? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing this example of how a national ecosystem assessment can be an enabling force for human rights-based approach in biodiversity conservation and co-creation of knowledge. We hope we inspired some of the participants who joined us from countries that perhaps don't have uh, yet, I would say, national ecosystem assessment or related work. Thank you very much, Anna. And I hand it over back to Sofia for the questions and answers. 
Over. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for facilitating uh, that insightful fireside chat. And thank you, Anna, for sharing how Bosnia and Herzegovina worked with knowledge holders on the National Ecosystem Assessment. Now it's time to open the floor to questions from participants. And I also invite the speakers to unmute and participate. <laughs> But first, I wanted to, to acknowledge there are people all over the world from South Africa, from Nepal, from Mauritius, from Pakistan, from Cameroon, uh, from Northeast India, from Kenya, uh, from Brazil, uh, from Bangladesh. Um, so I wanted to, to, from Uganda, so I wanted to, Philippines, uh, Nigeria, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so, uh, First, um, maybe I know, uh, Puri, you had been um, answering the question regarding uh, climate change. Uh, so um, how about indigenous peoples and local communities be given a chance in the United Nations Convention on Bio uh, Biological Diversity, uh, the CBD and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change sitting as a party? Um, and, and also this is connected to another question on, um, is there a human rights-based approach in climate change too? Um, or how do you think climate change can be cooperated um, dialogue with the biodiversity one? Um, so I don't know, Puri, if you wanna, uh, if you already replied this on the chat or if you wanna um, say something um, and address it to, to everyone, um, that would be great, either Bernila or, or Puri. Onto that. Yes. Uh, are we? Yes. yes yeah, Thank you. Know. Yes, we um, we were actually just uh, texting some answers here, <laughs> but um, in in terms of um, indigenous peoples and local communities being parties, I think that um, uh, what we are doing in the Convention on Biological Diversity, which I know most, I mean, uh, Puri is engaging more in, in the climate and I, but we work together. Anyway, uh, the, what we have been doing and IIFB have been very much working for is that uh, International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity will have, that you will have, for example, in the ATA meetings, you have a co-chair from, uh, from uh, IIFB, and uh, you have also a parallel bureau. So you meet with the bureau between the different constituencies. So, and it's also about the right to speak and so on. So it's a constant discussion how you can make the, um, indigenous peoples and local communities more visible in their proposals. And to make them a party, I mean, uh, legally, it would be quite difficult as the parties are the members of the treaties and they are it in terms of being national sovereign states which can take responsibilities for implementing the decisions so on uh, but there is both this more procedural thing of how to do it and also to ensure actually that parties implement the human rights based approach in their um, implementation of the convention and also in their policy processes that is maybe the way forward yeah and maybe to just add a little bit on the climate change i mean the the latest uh ipcc report the six synthesis report it just came out last march i mean it clearly states that adaptation and mitigation actions that prioritize equity, social justice, climate justice, rights-based approaches, and inclusivity will lead to more sustainable outcomes, reduce trade-offs, support transformative change, and advance climate resilience, and then including also in the synthesis report um, how um, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, as well as um, their knowledge and the knowledge systems are also highlighted in this. So in the climate change, yes, it, it has been being brought up more and more. And 
so that's from the the science perspective and then like going into the negotiations part in the UNFCCC I mean there's also just like in the in the CBD there's the 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 indigenous peoples caucus and in the in the in the UNFCCC it's the same that there's also the ELSIP the local community um and indigenous peoples caucus there um and then um, there's also like this regular, just coming out from Bonn, for example, this regular um, meeting on advancing the uh, IPLC's participation in the UNFCCC process, where we go through different agenda and how um, the participations of indigenous peoples um, through LSIP or the IPOs actually um, taking into consideration and how it is being implemented. And then also for parties, there's a regular um, event like um, on the, um, what they called actually as a, as a training. Oh, yeah. Yeah, as a training to, um, to um, ensure the inclusion and the, uh, the participations of indigenous peoples like in the process um, of the UNFCCC in general. So yeah, these are some examples that I could provide for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Puri, and thank you, Bernila, for addressing the question. Uh, now I have one that maybe um, Nigel uh, could st step in. Um, how about uh, indigenous peoples and local communities be given a chance? Um, so it's, it's the same question, but um, I know Nigel have been working on this, and um, the question also involves uh, indigenous peoples host a large biodiversity and are important conservationists, uh, which is true. So, so maybe Nigel has um, some insights on, on the questions regarding the UN CBD and the UN FCC. Okay, let me thank you for the opportunity in fact, of posing the question. So I think as some of you realize the um, parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, first of all, they built in uh, very important components back in 1992 when the CBD was first drafted by the parties. And in fact, that, that whole process, which took place in Rio de Janeiro, involved a lot of uh, dialogue and consultation with indigenous peoples who were very well represented, as well as other parties parts of society uh, that were there, are farmers, uh, youth, uh, women's groups. Um, and so the actual text of the CBD speaks uh, explicitly around uh, traditional knowledge systems and the recognition, recognition of rights related to that. So the CBD already had that built into its, uh, into its uh, architecture, into its design. Uh, but what happened in, uh, in 2022, which was really important, is that the new uh, work plan, which is the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that um, uh, that our uh, sweat bio colleagues have been referring to, it elaborates a lot more rights-based issues. So in a way, this is a, also a historic moment for the UN that uh, the parties to the convention uh, of their own will uh, make a correlation between rights-based approaches uh, with explicit attention to Indigenous peoples, also to other uh, constituencies, uh, but particularly to Indigenous peoples, and particularly pays attention to rights-based uh, issues associated with knowledge uh, and territory so so and and the free prior and informed consent so it's worth reading not only the main text of the, of the um, global biodiversity framework but also the uh, addendum that deals with the nature culture uh, um, elements including the joint program of work on uh, the links between bi biological and, and cultural diversity which uh, still need to be elaborated so the, so the rights-based framework is there. So all of those create a lot of opportunities and uh, rights are implemented fundamentally at, at, at the level where people live. So um, it's the right to do something or the right not to have something done to you, uh, which is kind of the, the operational part. Uh, so whether Indigenous people can be involved in the process, conventions are UN instruments or treaties uh, that are designed by the member states of the United Nations system. So they represent each sovereign government in the world, if 
if they choose to be involved in a convention. All, all sovereign governments belong to the UN system, more or less, uh, but it's optional whether they want to uh, be involved in a convention process. Most governments belong to the biodiversity uh, and, uh, and climate um, conventions. And in that process, there is a, a multilateral uh, agreement uh, that will uh, look at operationalizing that, look at targets that they want to achieve, you know, what is the purpose of the convention and who should be involved in the implementation. Um, and in, in case it's not clear, indigenous people have been very active in that in the in the biodiversity uh, convention, which includes speaking to governments, speaking to other actors, defining what their expectations are. And Lucy, who very unfortunately is not with us because she's one of the elders of that process, uh, Lucy Mulanke from Kenya, uh, has been uh, playing a leading role uh, in the International uh, Indigenous uh, Forum on um, on biodiversity. And so the expression of indigenous people's interests and 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 advice has been presented uh, through a whole series of meetings uh, through many years, but particularly in the negotiations around the global biodiversity framework. And that's now been uh, taken up by the member states, by the parties to the convention in the text. So it creates a great opportunity. And already we've had a bit of input here, but there has been a similar process uh, under the framework convention on climate change. And it's the Paris Agreement. And I put in a few notes uh, on, in the text there. The Paris Agreement, which was adopted in 2015, uh, that was the first international instrument that made a direct association between climate policy and uh, human rights and uh, that indigenous People were very, very active in the lobbying of that process, and there was a historic decision as well in Paris to include references to a range of human rights, but explicit attention to the rights of Indigenous peoples, the knowledge systems of Indigenous peoples, and the importance of involving Indigenous peoples and local communities in a whole range of decision-making areas, but particularly around climate adaptation. Um, there is a similar process under the Convention um, for to combat desertification. Uh, uh, which is not quite as elaborate as the, you see in the other two conventions, but the three sister conventions under the Rio uh, system uh, all have these, these elements in them. The big question is the operationalization of them, so making them live. And this webinar, amongst many other actions, are to help people understand what those rights are, that they know that they are rights bearers, uh, and that they can be active in, in that. And Enna's example was a great example that there's an increasing sensitivity that you cannot just make a decision because it looks like a good biodiversity or a good uh, climate decision. You need to think about the rights bearers in that process. So it's more negotiable negotiated, more dialogic, and more comprehensive in the decision making. So, Sophia, I hope that covered uh, some of the elements of what people would like to hear about in that sense. And back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for your insights. I don't know, there were some uh, hands raised before. I don't know it's if someone wants to raise their hand and, and participate live and ask a question or share any thoughts. Uh, I have been seeing some raise hands during the during the webinar, so please free to to raise a hand and we can unmute you and and you can share your thoughts or questions. Um, if not, I will invite any any speaker um, if they want to answer any particular question. Or here we have: um, Can the speakers provide any ex concrete example on how applying human rights based approach has led to a positive transformational change in terrestrial or marine protection? Um, we also have a question on, on how are duty bearers um, identified, and so maybe. Those questions um, could be could be addressed by any of the speakers. Ah, I have two raised hands, so maybe first. I can raise the hand. Then, where are we raising the hand? Did we raise it now? Can you know I have raised hand? Ah, Puri and Pernilla. Yes, please. The floor is yours. Um, yes. Uh, well, examples of uh, where we have had transformational change by in inviting um, 
uh, indigenous peoples and local communities as rights holders to actively engage. I can take uh, some Swedish uh, example, for example, the World Heritage Sites of La Laponia, which was a um, um, national park before, but in a, a few decades ago, it was an agreement to make it co-governed by the indigenous Sami people. And actually it has led to, um, um, well, a lot of more uh, engagement by them, for example, in, in uh, keeping also the system for visitors to the, uh, the system of cost cottages where you live, but also for them to facilitate the reindeer herding and so on. Um, and we have also another example of a national park at the, the Coster Islands. It's a marine park, which was uh, inaugurated uh, 15 years ago, and it was co-created, it's co-governed, co and has meant that the marine biodiversity is uh, increasing and people feel well. So, so it's like two very nearby examples. Thank you, Pernilla. I will now give the floor to Lorena Gomez. Please, Lorena. Yeah, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you all. Um, and I just want to open, it's more of a commentary. I'm curious about what you think uh, about the last comment and posted on the chat, because um, I worked with uh, indigenous organizations before in different dialogues at a local level um, in Colombia and then in Latin America and then globally. And I could definitely see this pattern of uh, representativeness, which because um, you tend to see the same leaders over and over again um, in different events. Um, but I think the most, so these of course filters the perspectives from the ground that reach these spaces. Um, but I think even more important than that would be like, how possible do you think it would be to start bringing those big dialogues that happen in big cities, in Washington, in Paris, um, to bring them to the ground? Because there's this epistemic framework that gets lost when you're surrounded with nature by nature and like uh, when indigenous people are able to express um, feeling comfortable uh, playing like locals. Uh, so I wonder how possible do you see that uh, if we dare to imagine that participation could be done in a different way? Thank you, thank you, Lorena. And I think Buri or Pernilla, um, they have their hands raised. Maybe they wanna reply. To Lorena and then yes. Nigel. Yes, I, I I was so very happy about this question because this is actually exactly what we do in our multiple evidence based dialogue that we uh, are moving the processes out in the communities and discuss and have dialogues on biodiversity and co creation of knowledge where people live and hold the knowledge, which actually immediately make this equity across knowledge system so visible. And of course you can do the same with policy processes and many uh, indigenous peoples and local communities organization, when they have trying to negotiate with governments about protected areas, one of the most efficient tool, if you can get the decision makers out in the area and show them how you take care of biodiversity, which will make it much easier to solve the problem. So I think this is definitely possible and something we really should encourage and have as an example of implementation of a human rights-based approach to create equity across knowledge system in policy and co-creation of knowledge. Thank you, thank you, Bernila and and Bori. I don't know, Nigel, if you wanted to um, 
Yes, just a quick word to say. I, I mean, I think it's the scale that you're talking about. And uh, I too, you know, for many years worked in these forums and I can pretty much predict which ethnic groups I'm going to see when I go into a meeting. Uh, and I, first of all, I think we have to thank those mm -hmm. indigenous people's organizations for taking that leadership. It takes a lot of time and energy from their side to represent uh, indigenous people's voices uh, at the UN. Uh, it's long hours, uh, expertise they have to develop being away from their families, away from their communities, it's hard work. So first of all, to, to honor them, they're very important leaders and change makers. Uh, many of the indigenous people I work with uh, when living in Africa do not speak English or French or even, you know, sometimes not at all the national language. Uh, and it's a very different process to work with those communities. And uh, I, I, one day I heard a senior indigenous leader say, some people don't know about the permanent forum. Well, my experience was some people didn't know that the UN even existed. So uh, I think trying to get it down to the ground is part of the process. And what is very interesting around BestNet uh, is it's an opportunity to do that. So uh, in a number of countries now, we have got, we're working with national entities to be able to have discussions with communities right at grassroots level around their knowledge within this right space framework. And that is what makes BestNet such an important opportunity. Um, at the same time, the idea is to really work towards equity. And I can assure you inside the UN system, uh, I, I help co-chair the interagency support group on indigenous peoples for the whole of the UN. We try very much to concentrate on the idea of diversity. So making sure all regions are represented, a principle that indigenous peoples have upheld, but also to try to uh, involve a, a diversity of knowledge holders. So people from ocean systems, desert systems, rainforest systems, there's so much diversity in the indigenous world. Um, and so how to, how to uh, recognize and value that and facilitate and make it easier for people to participate. But that also includes people understanding what their rights are to be at the table, uh, wherever that table may happen to be, even if there's not a table, even if it's under a tree. So I think there's a lot of sensitivity to that. There's also the reality of how to make that uh, work in practice. And part of the answer is to scale it to different levels to, to make things accessible. Thanks, and back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. And I see um, uh, Chao has um, the, the hand raised, but we don't have any more time. I'm sorry, we will address um, Chao, please write your questions or your thoughts, and we will address these in an interactive um, article after the webinar. Uh, we thank you, everyone, for your active participation and engagement throughout this webinar. As we approach the conclusion, um, I would like to invite Yuko uh, Kurauchi, BestNet Coordinator and Program Specialist at BestNet UNDP, to deliver the closing remarks. Yuko, please share your concluding thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, and I'd like to start my uh, remark by thanking everybody once again for joining us today for this enlightening and thought provoking webinar. Uh, and then on behalf of the organizing team, um, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the uh, esteemed um, the speakers who shared their variable insights and expertise throughout the webinar. Um, your diverse perspectives have provided us with a comprehensive understanding of the importance of human rights uh, for biodiversity conservation. And as we conclude this session, I'd like to emphasize that the best net we remains committed to fostering um, inclusive and a human rights-based approach uh, throughout the project components that we are working on and contributing to uh, creating an environment where knowledge is not only scientifically sound, but also um, ethically and socially just. After this event, we will send a message in due course to all the participants with the link to the webinar recording and a dedicated article outlining the key webinar highlights, including the responses to the questions not fully addressed um, at this moment due to the uh, time constraints. And we are sorry about this. Meanwhile, um, I would like to invite the participants to stay connected with us and then continue the important conversations initiated during this webinar today. Uh, and then there are several ways to engage uh, with the BestNet uh, network. So next slide, please, to show some of the examples. So firstly, uh, please visit our website at www.bestnet.world, where you can access a wealth of resources, um, including publications, case studies, um, and then other relevant materials related to biodiversity and ecosystem services, as well as our work uh, related to indigenous uh, peoples. And then by becoming a registered user of the website, you can also provide your resources to the library as well. 
Also, uh, please consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter and stay up to date with the latest development of our project and our partners. And then other events, opportunities, which may be available uh, in the biodiversity field, including the future webinars and other exciting initiatives coming up. Or uh, please connect with us um, on social media. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and then LinkedIn, and then join our Vibrant online community where you can engage in discussions and then share your own experience and perspectives. Um, all these details will be included in our post webinar message to you as well. And by staying connected with BestNet, um, you will not only have the opportunity to continue continuously learning and then collaborating with experts in this field, but also contributing to the collaborative effort in promoting a human rights based approach to knowledge co creation and in joint application on the ground. So once again, um, I want to express my deepest appre appreciation to all your all our speakers and participants um, for your valuable contributions today. And your dedication and insight has made this webinar a resounding success. And thank you. And then I wish all continued success in your endeavors to create a more just and sustainable world. Thank you. And then goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.